it's so great to um, be part of this. And uh, again, thanks to the whole Bits team for putting it together. This is obviously a different sort of RT2 because we're virtual uh, instead of uh, getting to meet each other in person. But it was really fun to be in the breakout room and get to know uh, at least a few of you guys now. And I hope to, to get to know more of you, um, you know, throughout the, uh, throughout the week. Uh, and it was it was also fantastic to see the participant list. I didn't know people like Mongolian heavy metal, but I'm going to Google that later. Um, and uh, just the the kind of mix of disciplines and the international uh, group of participants at different levels uh, of the research you know training or or you know research practitioner uh, life cycles is awesome. So I'm really happy to be here. I will say, as Katie noted before, feel free to interrupt me. Just raise your hand. You can also chat. I'm, I, it's a little harder for me to monitor the chat, but maybe you know Katie and Alex can monitor the chat, and you can raise your hand if you have questions. So feel free to interrupt me if, if things come up. But I've also left some time at the end uh, for discussion. So you know, think of things you want to ask at the end as well. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm really happy to talk about um, uh, the scientific ethos, uh, misconduct, and transparency. Um, you know, this is a um, you know, topic that's really core to what we're going to be going through this week. And, you know, on some level, you can see the, the two talks that I'm giving as really setting up a lot of what's going to come next uh, in terms of specific practices and skills that, that folks are going to be, uh, you know, gaining during the training course and then even into the, the discussions next week. Uh, so this is a little bit of a framing and setup um, kind of talk. So again, I'm, I'm Ted Miguel or Edward Miguel. I'm a development economist. I work with different types of data. And uh, my research mainly focuses on African economic and political um, development, although I've worked on a few different uh, parts of the world and, and different topics. And over the last decade or so, more and more of my um, you know, research effort has gone into working on issues around open science and research transparency. And really, uh, you know, the, the work together with BITS has, has been some of the, the most exciting stuff that I've been, uh, that I've been working on uh, lately. So uh, just in terms of the, the kind of RT2 roadmap that Katie had referenced uh, before, there's really a few different areas here that, that I'll be touching on. I mean, I think the talk today is really going to focus on ethical you know, research more than, than anything. But um, you know, as we talk about ethical research, we'll touch on a few different topics. My second talk in a couple hours or an hour or so uh, is going to focus a lot on pre-registration and pre-analysis plans. So something that's kind of, even though we see this as a, uh, you know, feedback loop, um, very often in, in, in certain projects, at least, the pre-registration pre and pre-analysis plans will be sort of towards the beginning of a, of a project life cycle. Uh, and there'll be a lot more discussion of related issues uh, by Alex and, and, by, and by Katie and others uh, in the next, next few days. Okay, so let me just start by talking about some of the, the foundational scientific norms that have inspired a lot of the open science uh, movement. Um, there's a kind of style of doing research, an ethos, you could call it, that um, folks who study science, sociologists of science, historians of science, have been able to describe and capture. And, and one of the most famous descriptions of these norms was um, uh, articulated by Robert Merton, the sociologist, uh, 20th century um, American sociologist, and in his 1942 um, you know, book on, on this issue, it's a chapter in a book, um, he lays out and really crystallizes what he sees as the key elements of this ethos or this style of doing research that uh, he calls you know, you know, core scientific norms. This is a very influential description of those norms. It's been very heavily cited and, and it's led to really a, a very large subsequent literature and debate about you know, what is the essence of um, what you could think of as ethical scientific research or, uh, you know, the right approach to, to, to carrying out science, or at least one, one approach. Um, and the, the kind of key um, dimension of what he, he talks about is, is, is understanding scientific research as being embedded in social norms, institutions, social structures. Uh, so we don't think of a scientist or a researcher as being an isolated you know, person doing their work, but they're really operating within a social system that has rules and that has has norms about what 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 is right and wrong. Um, and uh, you know, the one kind of articulation of this in Merton, and I put some of the page numbers there if you want to find the you know the the book, uh, is 
you know, it's not that we only have a certain set of norms as researchers because we think they're efficient. They're going to lead us to the best uh, scientific data, the best scientific uh, understanding. Um, but that researchers in that, that work within this system also see them as right and good. They, they actually attach some normative value to uh, these practices. And, and that's what we're going to understand. And I, and I think, you know, this kind of understanding is also central to how, how the open science movement has, has developed. So there's four core values or norms that Merton uh, articulates that uh, I think still resonate today as well as we'll talk about. Uh, and I'll go through them one by one, but just quickly, the first is universalism, then communality, disinterestedness. I know, again, for, for some non-native English speakers, you could be like, wait, what is that word? And, you know, disinterestedness means not feeling a personal interest in, in the research, as I'll talk about. Um, and then fourth is organized skepticism. Um, so again, I'll go through these in detail detail now, there's been some discussion about where did this culture even come from? You may say, okay, Merton was describing this set of scientific norms or the scientific ethos, and some scholars, as they've tried to understand the rise of modern science and the, and the rise of contemporary research universities, uh, actually trace a number of these ideals back into the Middle Ages in Europe to the practices of um, monastic scholars, meaning the monks and other scholars who were working in monasteries. Very often they were basically transcribing or you know, writing out manuscripts or Bibles or religious texts, uh, but they developed a set of norms and practices and a kind of culture. And of course, a lot of the, the early European universities flowed directly out of these monasteries. Um, and so there's elements of that culture in these values, just as a kind of historical background, for better or for worse. And we'll talk about you know, ways in which these values in a few slides, I'll talk about how these values also break, you know, quite, quite strongly from, from uh, you know, religious scholarship. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the scientific ethos and what Merton focuses on, but in, you know, in truth, there's many other dimensions of uh, ethical research. I'm not going to focus on them as much today, but they are they're important parts of the open science, um, you know, discussion, and they're incredibly important in their own right, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to mainly focus on them um, today. So, you know, for instance, the first thing you may think of when we talk about ethical research might be, you know, ethical treatment of human subjects or animal subjects. And that's what we think of, you know, in terms of ethical review boards for people who have gone through uh, IRBs, institutional review boards. Um, so, you know, there's active debates today about what is, what does ethical research mean when randomized controlled trials are being carried out? Uh, what constitutes ethical research when working with vulnerable populations. So there's a whole set of research ethics around those topics that I'm not going to mainly focus on um, today, but that are also very important. And at some RT2s and, and, and uh, you know, open science gatherings, those are, those are quite central topics. Katie, did you want to jump in? I can't hear you actually, Katie. I don't know if I'm, can others hear you? Hmm. Yeah, I can't, huh. I can't hear Katie. Can other people hear Katie? No? No. Okay, I can't hear you, Katie. Uh, let me see, there's something in the chat. Okay, thanks, Pallavi, for, for uh, weighing in on that. Did, was there a question, Katie, you wanted to jump in on, or maybe, do you want to put it in the chat, maybe? Sorry for the confusion there. Uh, we, we just had uh, someone in the breakout room. So um, yeah, there, there wasn't a question. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, sorry. No, I just saw Katie um, unmuted and I thought she was talking. So my bad. Okay, I'll just, uh, I'll just keep going. Thanks, Alex. Um, okay, so in terms of other dimensions of, of uh, research ethics, um, we talked about ethical treat, you know, briefly I mentioned ethical treatment, say, of human subjects. Another one is you know, what is appropriate professional behavior within a research team among students, staff, and colleagues? How do people treat each other? And there's elements of ethical behavior there. Again, I'm not going to mainly focus on that uh, here. Uh, and then finally, you know, again, when we think of ethical behavior in a scholarly sense, we may immediately think of things like fraud and plagiarism. And of course, that's going to be related to some of what I'll talk about today in terms of research norms. 
Um, but Merton's scientific ethos and norms are, are a bit different than these topics, as you'll see. Uh, and they're more about an approach to carrying out research. So all these other issues are incredibly important and they're part of the ethical discussion of research, uh, but a little different than Merton's uh, focus. So uh, if you're interested in work on these types of ethical issues, some of them are discussed in the textbook. Uh, and uh, we at BITS, Katie and Alex can also point you to some other uh, you know, writing on these issues. For instance, there's been some interesting writing about, I'm a development economist, so this, this was interesting to me, about ethical approaches to carrying out research in international settings or in low-income settings. I think for many of us in the room, those are pretty important uh, issues. So for instance, there's been some work by Scott Desposado at UCSD on exactly this issue and, and others. So if you're interested in that, you know, you can jump on, you know, ask questions in the Slack channel to, to Alex or Katie or Fernando and, and they can help uh, point you towards some of those. Okay, uh, but let me, let me jump back to the Mertonian uh, norms and I'll talk about the first, uh, you know, pillar of the Mertonian norms, which is universalism. So uh, Merton calls universalism uh, the, 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 the approach in which the acceptance or rejection of scientific claims does not depend on the attributes of their protagonist, meaning the researcher herself or himself. In other words, research findings on some fundamental level are impersonal. The research speaks for itself. The mathematical proof speaks for itself. The data speaks for itself. And it doesn't matter if I say it or Katie or Alex or anybody here, the science should speak for itself. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're rich and famous, and you're a scientist, it doesn't, does, doesn't make your science right or wrong. It doesn't matter if you're poor and not famous, that doesn't make your science uh, right or wrong. The science speaks for itself. And um, you know, the, the point Merton makes is in, in social settings where the larger culture opposes these universalistic norms, the scientific ethos is really put under pressure. Uh, so in a society where particular social groups are um, oppressed, particular social groups are not given equal rights, particular social groups' views are not valued. If someone from one of those views is a scientist advancing uh, you know, research, uh, their work may not actually be given equal weight. And that contradicts this fundamental pillar of universalism. So central to this idea, this universalistic pillar is the possibility that all individuals are able to enter into scientific careers, as, as Merton puts it, that careers be open to talents, regardless of who the individual is. So here, this pillar really links in with democracy, equal opportunity, um, and you know, to the extent that bringing different voices and all these talents into science is really critical for driving science, societies that restrict access to research careers to people with certain social characteristics won't have as rapid scientific progress as more democratic or open societies. Okay, so that's the, the principle. So you can see there's a, an element of inclusion and equality, a social equality built in here. And I just wanted to illustrate this just with one you know, poignant example. There are many, there are many poignant examples of talented individuals who sought out scientific or research careers um, who were not able to um, uh, succeed in science or able to access opportunity within science because of their social attributes. And in fact, there's a very active discussion debate right now today within my own field of economics about the lack of inclusion, lack of diversity, and lack of opportunity for people of different social backgrounds. So just a famous example that we talk about in the textbook is David Blackwell, who's a very famous African-American mathematician, statistician. And in fact, a lot of his work ends up being foundational to modern game theory and statistics. Um, he, was, uh, he was actually the first African-American inducted into the US National Academy of Sciences. He was the first black tenured professor at UC Berkeley in the math department. But his career was almost derailed multiple times because when he was getting his training in the 1930s and 40s, um, uh, racism was even more prevalent in the U.S. than it is today. And, you know, he was actually a mathematical genius. He went to college as a young teenager, finished his undergrad at University of Illinois before age, I think, 19. Um, but when he tried to get faculty position, and then got his PhD a few years later, when he tried to 
engage in the, in the mathematical research community, he wouldn't, he wasn't hired because he was black. Um, at Princeton, at other places, uh, eventually he was a faculty member at Howard University, a uh, historically uh, African-American college, before eventually being hired at Berkeley and then becoming a huge figure in the field. But we could ask ourselves, how many other David Blackwells um, and their talent was lost to science because of racism, because of discrimination against women or against people uh, who, who are uh, you know, not socially dominant in a certain society. So I don't want to dwell on it, but uh, you know, uh, David Blackwell is a, a great illustration and we could wonder without the David Blackwells and the Einsteins and others, like how many such people were lost because of the lack of universalism um, in, uh, in the scientific community. Okay, the, the second uh, pillar of uh, scientific norms according to, to Merton is communality. Uh, and the idea behind communality is that scientific progress belongs to the scientific community, that all of us make progress as researchers because we are part of a community. We collaborate, we, we stand on the shoulders of our predecessors, we work together with colleagues and students, et cetera. Um, and because of that, this principle holds that our scientific insight also belongs to the community, that we don't sort of just benefit privately from it uh, rather than the, the community. So, this is really a core kind of open science principle as well. You can see it right away. As Merton writes, secrecy is the antithesis of this norm. Full and open communication, it's enactment. Uh, and of course, you know, journals, scientific journals, and making, you know, publishing your research is really all about communality. When you publish research, you're making it public for others to see, uh, and you're sharing it. So uh, Merton writes that, the communality of the scientific ethos is incompatible with the definition of technology as private property. So you can see a really strong tension here between you know, making progress, say, on a particular you know, new uh, you know, microchip technology, um, where scientific, the scientific ethos says, look, you're making progress, you're building on centuries of science, you should share that with everybody, versus companies desire to sort of patent or control those technologies and not share them you know, with, with the world. And you can see there's very strong tension here between the norms that we may think hold among academic researchers and corporate researchers. So where we sit in Berkeley in Northern California, right by Silicon Valley, this tension is real. And uh, you know, there's tremendous research groups at dozens of large corporations right near where we, where we work but their um, you know, culture within those firms is not necessarily to publish and share what they're doing with others. Uh, it's to make money off that, that science for themselves. And that runs very strongly against the principle of communality that Merton and others uh, have articulated. I'll come back to this a little bit uh, later on. Okay, the third pillar is disinterestedness. In other words, researchers should not be acting out of self-interest or their own, say, monetary motivations, but they should be motivated by finding the truth. So this is a really important pillar for Merton uh, and for the scientific ethos. And I think for all of us who are, you know, whatever our degree of experience in the scientific or research community, you know, this is a core pillar. Our goal as researchers is to try to find the truth. Um, so, you know, Merton has this great quote, a passion for knowledge, idle curiosity, altruistic concern to do things for the benefit of humanity, all these things have been attributed to the scientists, that our, our sort of ethos, our culture should be one of um, really disinterestedness of uh, altruism. Byrne actually argues that it's not because those of us who are researchers are any different as people from anybody else. It's just that we operate within this particular social system or ecosystem, scientific social system, in which these norms and values are really privileged. And that's what encourages us um, to act in this way. Um, so it isn't that we're, we're better than anybody else because we're researchers and we're trying to find the truth, uh, but we're kind of uh, you know, uh, socialized into these values. Okay, the fourth pillar of the Mertonian norms uh, is organized skepticism. And this again is really critical and this ties in really directly to open science uh, practices. So what he says is scientific research really involves the verifiability of results. Other scientists don't just accept your findings on faith, or they shouldn't. 
other experts are going to scrutinize your results. So he says the activities of scientists are subject to rigorous policing to a degree perhaps unparalleled in any other field of activity. So you can think of the fact that you know, referees judge our manuscripts, editors judge our manuscripts. We present in seminars and conferences and people disagree and argue and debate. And you have to go through that whole process in order to get scientific research accepted in the community, published, and to become a kind of pillar for the next uh, research project. So really the ability to verify results and data and scrutinize claims is critical uh, for research. And you know, in again, different fields have different norms and there's many different styles of research, even among those of us here who are part of, uh, of RT2. But if you think of you know, when Merton was writing this in the 1940s, he was thinking very much of um, you know, physics, experimental physics research, chemistry research. I think those were the fields that kind of inspired some of his, his writing. And I think what he's thinking of here is, you know, if there's a particular experiment that's been run and someone claims to find it, well, other labs are going to try to rerun or replicate that experiment. And they're not really going to believe the result until it's been replicated. Uh, similarly, if a mathematician writes a proof, other mathematicians may spend months carefully going through that proof to make sure that it holds. Um, so, you know, this is really the core of, you know, research transparency is central to this because if I can't have visibility into what you did, I can't replicate it. Okay, so this is a, a key pillar. The last point here I wanted to, 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 to mention, which sort of ties back to the discussion about the medieval monasteries a little bit here, uh, Merton writes, the scientific investigator does not preserve the cleavage or, you know, the gap, the, the difference between the sacred and the profane between that which requires uncritical respect and that which can be objectively analyzed. So in many ways, this is a very sharp break from the religious monastic tradition of the Middle Ages where those scholars may have debated certain issues, but there were certain aspects of their faith that were certainly off limits to debate or else they'd get kicked out of the monastery or burned at the stake or, or whatever would have happened at that time. But uh, you know, the point here is, scientific investigators, researchers should be able to challenge everything and question everything. And that's the only way we're really gonna make progress. Because if we take certain topics and put them off limits to scrutiny, we're not gonna make progress in those areas. Okay, so here are, you know, here's the, the, the kind of, again, fourth pillar, organized um, skepticism. Uh, I'm happy if folks do have comments or questions now that I've kind of gone through those four. So just pause for 10 seconds. Anybody can, you can unmute yourself if you wanna ask a question or you can raise your hand, put something in the chat uh, about these four pillars of, of the Mertonian scientific ethos. I'm also happy to keep going if folks uh, are happy with that. Okay, there is a comment in the chat, let me see. Can we get the reference from where these quotes were taken as well? Yeah, so these quotes are all from Merton. So these are from that original Merton 1942. Um, and I believe, uh, I know I have it on my computer somewhere, but Katie or Alex can find this Mertonian, the 1942 article, which I think has these page numbers. So you can kind of, it's, it's definitely worth a read. It's a chapter in a book. I think it's only 20 something pages, but it's become this like famous uh, articulation. It's in the participant manual and we'll also, we can put a link in the chat for now too. Great. Okay, great. There's another uh, comment here. I'll, I'll take a look. How do you adjudicate between picking a topic that is of, of enough interest to pursue for years while not being too personally invested in the outcome? This is a fantastic question. So the tension a bit in with the Mertonian norms is many of us, dive into an area of research precisely because we're personally invested in it. Uh, I, you know, I personally began work in development economics because I was personally um, interested in understanding global poverty. I thought the best use of my time and effort and energy as a human being was to study the lives of the poorest people in the world. That's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to do things to try to uh, alleviate poverty or, or, or make a difference. And I think many of us in, in the research world are motivated by these sorts of concerns, of course, in many different areas. 
so Elaine has asked this question, but I think what the Mertonian um, norms would say is, yes, our passion can help us choose a topic, but once we do research in that area, we're bound to find the truth, we're bound to report to, with the same enthusiasm whether we're right or we're wrong, whether this uh, program that we think is going to fight global poverty was successful or unsuccessful, and we have to make those findings available to the scientific community. So the way I see it at least is um, we get to choose topics we're passionate about, Elaine, but, we, um, but then once we do research on them, we follow these norms, if that makes sense. Uh, okay, there's two others. So let me get through these two. These look like really interesting uh, questions. Seems like the publishers of research that require paywalls, particularly for research supported by public funds, exemplify the tension between communality and profit. Any thoughts on this tension or my interpretation? Uh, I think that's exactly right. This is from Shaun. Um, that's exactly right. And in fact, you know, the open science movement has many different aspects to it, as you'll see this week and in the, in the textbook. And, um, and one of the aspects of it relates to the ability to have open access to research. Um, and so there's been a big push towards greater open access and against for-profit publishers. So it's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, my own university system, the University of California, uh, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, um, cut off subscription payments to one of the largest for-profit publishers, which means we at the University of California have lost access to some of the latest journal publications published by that publisher. But it was a statement that was meant to put pressure on the for-profit for publishers and to move to a non-for-profit open access model. So I think you're right that there is a tension and it, it goes right to a Mertonian uh, norm. Uh, okay, and then uh, this is from Taman Ba. Um, I have just been wondering how organized skepticism was carried out when these core values were developed. Well, you wrote in 1842, but Merton was 1942. Um, I think between 1842 and 1942, there were some differences. By 1942, um, you know, there were telephones and, and, and telegraphs and, and different things to, to communicate more, more easily. Um, but even in 1842, there were scientific journals. So some of the very famous scientific journals like Nature and others have been around for hundreds of years publishing continuously. And so those scientific journals were really the way that the scientific community found out about different results and findings and communicated them. Before the journals, in terms of early science, or when journals were just starting up, scientists communicated through letters. So groups of scientists working on certain topics would send very detailed letters to each other detailing their scientific work um, and, and sharing them. So uh, there's always been that form of communication. Of course, we're in a, a really different era right now with the internet and with like incredibly rapid communication. And that allows us actually, without that technology, open science would be more challenging to achieve. But now if I have data, I just can post it online and a million people can download it. So the ability to really scrutinize other work and share it um, has just multiplied in the last few decades. I started um, graduate school in 1996. I was an undergrad in the early 90s and I was a research assistant at that time uh, for, for some professors. And in order to do some analysis on US census data, I had to go to a particular building across the city into their basement where they had tapes with data. And I had to write Fortran code to run through these tapes. And you could only do it where the tapes were because there was no internet. I mean, the internet existed in 1992 or 1993, but it was just in a very, rudimentary state. So I guess even in my own experience as a researcher, I've just seen the possibilities of open science, you know, just multiply. Okay, let me get to this last point, and then I'll get back to the, some of the, the slides. So this is by Stephen. Are Mertonian norms intended to produce convergence to a, a final true model? If so, on what time scale? At least in my subfield uh, in, in psychology, we have decades-long debates about fundamental issues. Our emotions or personality real that seem to have reached an agree to disagree equilibrium. This is a really uh, important point. 
I do think Bertonian norms are intended to produce convergence because the idea is if there's competing models, as long as you can run tests to distinguish between those models, then this scientific process should allow you to distinguish between those theories. Now, there are certain types of research that may not be amenable to testing between theories in an easy way. And you, you put here, you know, in a metaphysical sense, like if there's philosophical debates that are not amenable or where it's not useful or where you're not able to test, then you could have this um, uh, sort of permanent divergence or, or, you know, lack of convergence over time. It's not just in your field, Stephen. In economics, we've had some similar discussions in theoretical economics. So in certain branches of macroeconomic theory, there have been debates between scholars and some scholars have tried to bring in these Mertonian type norms and said, wait a minute, we're debating concepts that can't be tested. We really wanna be able to like write models that can be tested where we can agree, here's the test, let's distinguish between theory. If we're not making progress towards ruling out wrong theories, then are we even science? So for instance, the, the Nobel Prize winner, Paul Romer at NYU, who's uh, on the board of BITS actually, has been writing some critiques of macroeconomic theory, making exactly this point, kind of related to your point. Wait, if we're not testing stuff, we're not really science and we wanna be science. Um, so I think that's, that's a really interesting point. Okay, let me jump back to the slides. And then again, in a few slides, uh, when I get through some more material, I'll have a little pause and, and, and discussion on, on issues. Thanks for these great questions. Um, okay, so again, as I was talking about, these Mertonian norms really embed within them ideas of openness, integrity, transparency, you know, free communication, ability to verify and challenge. So then the question is, you know, how closely do we conform to these norms today? Uh, and I'll present a little bit of evidence on this uh, here. Together with colleagues, we've been trying to collect more systematic data on this across the social sciences. Um, that, you know, again, we can, we can talk about later. Um, so I'll talk about a piece by Anderson et al. Uh, and it's a little bit outdated now, 2007. That was part of our motivation for trying to bring in new, new data. But this is data collected about 15 years ago on uh, US researchers and basically whether they believe in the Mertonian norms, if you ask them, whether they themselves practice these norms or mostly follow these norms. And then the third is, what is their belief about the behavior of their colleagues, other scholars in their field? It's a pretty large sample, about 3,000 um, researchers. And the sampling frame was researchers who had received funding from the US National Institutes of Health. Uh, both early stage researchers at the postdoc level mainly, as well as more mid-career researchers, probably at the associate prof professor level on average. What's nice about this NIH data is NIH funds a very wide variety of research. So in this sample are people who had received research grants to do lab research, you know, biology lab research, people who are in public health doing, uh, you know, field research in public health, and then also social scientists, some economists, demographers, sociologists, psychologists who are studying social science issues related, say, to health behaviors. So um, it's, it's a kind of nice cross section uh, here and can give us some, uh, some insights. I will say one caveat on that. In this uh, paper, the response rate of the, the scientists who were asked to uh, you know, discuss their views was around 50%. So that, that's actually pretty good for a lot of surveys where people are contacted, um, you know, researchers are contacted, but it's not 100%. So it's still broadly representative, but just a caveat on the, on the data. So what Anderson does is, is she and her co-authors follow uh, Merton and all the others who have commented on Merton because there's a whole debate and, and discussion and, and literature now on these Mertonian norms and others who say, you know what, actually in scientific research, sometimes there are these counter norms, opposite norms. Um, so, Others have articulated that for each of the key Mertonian norms, some researchers seem to subscribe to or follow counter norms. So instead of universalism, um, some follow particularism, meaning instead of believing that 
all people are equally able to engage in research. No, they think there's you know, particular subgroups that should have more voice or more power. Instead of communality, secrecy. Instead of disinterestedness, self-interestedness in the research. Instead of organized skepticism, organized dogmatism, meaning organizing around a certain set of ideas and not challenging them, just believing in them no matter what. And I, you know, back to this debate in theoretical macroeconomics, some of Paul Romer's critiques of certain branches of macro theory uh, was that there were camps of people who were very dogmatic uh, instead of challenging their views or testing them. Uh, and then there's two other uh, norms or values that followers of Merton have added to this sort of range of, uh, of values. One is governance, meaning scientists are responsible for directing their own research, meaning they have autonomy, versus administration, meaning they're basically told what to study and told what to do. That that's another tension. Uh, and you can see that if, you know, scientists are told what to do, then uh, they're not necessarily going to be able to be skeptical of certain types of research. They may be told to work on certain issues or do certain things that challenge those core norms. Okay, and then the sixth norm is um, research quality or originality, focusing on that, new insights, rather than just quantity. Now this one, you know, some may have may challenge whether this fits in, but the idea is, you know, when we're judging the value of, of research, we shouldn't just count the number of papers mindlessly that someone's written. We should really focus on the core contribution and uh, what new insights we've gained. That doesn't mean quantity is bad. The reason I'm, I'm putting the caveat there is because if a scholar makes many new contributions, then more quantity is good, right? But um, you know, we should really focus on the contribution rather than just counting research outputs. Okay, so here are, th this is the articulation of the norms and the counter norms. And just to give you a little bit more sort of background on the debate, Scholars have actually come up with these kind of cute acronyms so that you can remember these different norms. So the first one, the, the Mertonian norms, sometimes are called the kudos norms, communality, universality, disinterestedness, organized skepticism. And the counter norms are sometimes called the place norms, proprietary, so that's like, you know, the technology belongs to a company, that's the secrecy point, local versus universal, authority based, commissioned. So commissioned is like this administration point that the research, again, someone tells you work on this problem rather than you choosing to do it. And then expert. So believing in experts because they're, they're quote experts rather than critically judging all of science. Okay, so these are just two sets of norms, kudos versus place. Uh, and here's another citation uh, for, for you know, the discussion between these sets of norms and the tension between them. Because even though Merton stated that you know, this, these were a certain set of scientific norms that, that most scientists followed, as we'll see in the Anderson, uh, not everybody follows these norms. So that's really the goal of, of the Anderson piece. They ran these surveys among thousands of scientists in the US about 15 years ago. And they asked them, do you believe in these norms? That's the top bar there. And I'll describe the details in a second. Subscription, meaning do you subscribe to these norms? Do you believe in these norms? The second one is gonna be own behavior. In your own research flow, do you follow these norms or not? And then the bottom one is others' behavior in your field. The light gray shading here is, again, based on about a dozen survey questions. People were classified into supporting the Mertonian norms. That's the light gray. The medium gray means they, they support some of the norms and not others, or they partially support the norms. And uh, the dark gray means when they're asked questions, they overwhelmingly oppose Mertonian norms and embrace the counter norms. So the first thing that you can uh, see in terms of subscription is when people are asked, do you believe in these norms? Do you believe in you know, basically open science and sharing your results and you know, these different you know, universality? Um, about 90% of people quite strongly support the norms. And then there's another, you know, five or eight percent who somewhat support them. But the overwhelming majority of scientists, researchers, um, support the norms. So that's the first uh, finding. When asked about their own behavior, it's a little bit different. 
about 70% say, yes, I overwhelmingly follow the norms. And then another group have kind of more mixed views, but only a kind of small share openly and actively sort of embrace the counter norms. Um, there's also this distinction made in the data between mid-career and early career scholars. They're broadly similar. Um, if anything, the early career seem a little less attached to the norm, which Anderson et al. and others speculate may have to do with um, uh, feelings of intense competition early in career that people may feel like, uh, you know, maybe embracing these norms puts them at a disadvantage if they share their data with others, et cetera. Then the final set here are what people perceive about others' behavior. And this is the really stunning uh, number, which is here, very few people, when asked about their actual practices, seem to actively emb embrace Mertonian norms. They're really sharing their data with others. They're really uh, judging others' work based on the quality of the work, not just on who said it, uh, et cetera. There's a group that's sort of a little bit more mixed, but um, you know, when asked about others' behavior, they believe that the vast majority of people are really not following the norms. Only about, they only believe about 10% of their colleagues are following the norms. So there's actually a big gap between what they say about their own behavior in those middle bars versus what they say about others' behaviors in those um, bottom bars. So this is a kind of striking figure, but it speaks to the fact that a lot of researchers don't think we're actually very close to following uh, the Mertonian norms. Now I do see in the chat that a couple of um, things came up. Huh, the bottom half is not showing up properly. Oh, okay. Um, is that true for most people? I'm sorry about that, if, uh, if that's the case. It's showing up now. I think it was just because you were covering the, the bottom two, the mid-career, or the own behavior. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was, I, that, was, that was part of the, uh, the big reveal here on, uh, on the bottom panel. So sorry about that. Yeah, now hopefully you can see it. Uh, hopefully you can see it all. But um, great. Um, so you know, if there are any other comments or questions, I can also pause here now that I've paused. Uh, in terms of thoughts or comments on this, this figure or this result? Does anybody have, have thoughts? I'm gonna discuss it in the next few slides, but I'm happy to, to take some comments now. Let's see if there's a chat on this. Okay, uh, from Ruben. How do we reconcile the need for quality in research with the reality of a job market that many times pushes scientists to adopt a focus on quantity over quality? I think this is a central issue and it's something that's come up a lot in the open science community, that there is this tension that you know, very often there's a, a type of, of thinking that somehow not following open science, not sharing, not being as collaborative with colleagues can benefit individuals in the short run. And then you're raising a kind of related but somewhat different point, which is what if I'm just judged on like, my, I'm gonna get tenure based on literally just the number of publications uh, and you know, the quality of them may be kind of, of less important. So we, we, we work within an ecosystem, a set of incentives, constraints, and rules, social systems that do not always incentivize open science behaviors. And part of what BITS has been doing, part of what the Center for Open Science has been doing, and others in this space is trying to move the scientific community to adopt new rules, norms, etc., that are really more consistent with open science principles. And Alex will talk about some of those. Katie will talk about some of those uh, when we talk about some of BITS's initiatives. The Center for Open Science has been working on some of those. So hopefully during the course of the week, um, you'll see that there's work that's meant to deal with these issues, but they are core issues here. And for certain people at certain moments, they may feel a very strong trade-off between following these norms and doing what's in the best interest of their career. And that creates a lot of tension. And the hope is over time, we can change the norms to reduce that tension. Okay, so let me um, move to um, this point. So this is exactly the point that a lot of researchers feel some sort of normative dissonance, that they feel attached to these norms and they wanna follow them, but they feel that a lot of other scholars are not following them or they feel like it'll hurt them professionally if they follow them. So they have this normative dissonance or what's called the disillusionment gap in, in Anderson et al. Um, so that is a fundamental issue. You know, you may look at that figure before and say, okay, which of those data are sort of most accurate? 
is it really only 10% of people who were following Mertonian norms then, or was it the 70%? It's really hard to know from that date alone. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle, but um, you, know, you might think that people may be a little more honest about behavior when they talk about their colleagues than when they talk about their own beliefs and own behavior. So those of us in development economics, for instance, sometimes we wanna measure how much corruption there is and we run surveys to measure corruption. But we don't usually ask individuals themselves, okay, how corrupt were you? How, much bri how many bribes did you pay? Because that's illegal and they put them at risk and we may think that they're not gonna tell us the truth. So what we do in development economics when we work on corruption is we ask questions like, how do firms like yours in your city, in your sector, how much do they typically pay in a month in bribes? And we think that's gonna give us a better answer. So, you know, you might think that that lower number could be more accurate for that reason. But, you know, again, we're doing some work with a team at BITS and, and with other colleagues at Princeton and elsewhere um, to try to measure these practices and beliefs today uh, as well. Okay, so a couple more, uh, you know, points here from the Anderson et al that were, were interested, interesting. Related to this point about communality, in their survey, the researchers who were working at private for-profit research organizations, some of whom get NIH grants. So NIH funds researchers in a wide range of institutional settings or organizations. Those researchers in for-profit organizations were significantly more likely to subscribe to the counter norms, more likely to say, yeah, I don't really believe in, in this open science set of practices. Also, people who in the surveys believe their field was more competitive were more likely to kind of break with the Mertonian norm. So again, there's something you know, related here maybe to competitive pressure or pressure to make money that, that seems to erode these norms. Um, two other little factoids uh, in the data, those with PhDs from non-US institutions in their data were somewhat more likely to support the counter norms I'm not sure exactly why, that's just a pattern in the data. Um, there was slightly higher belief in the Mertonian norms among female scholars in their data than male scholars. Although for both of those bottom two points, the, the differences weren't huge. Uh, but there were some interesting patterns that are worthy of further um, exploration. And I do think the fact that there are these differences across field and organization um, and maybe the training individuals got really speak to the importance of researchers being socialized into these norms. Researchers who kind of get trained or brought up in different um, environments or settings um, sort of may, may, may adopt different norms and have different beliefs. Um, okay, so just a couple more slides and then I want to open it up to general discussion in the last you know, 10 minutes or so. Um, what Anderson et al. find in their work is that this mismatch between scholars' beliefs and their desire to be open and, and, and you know, follow research transparency practices, uh, but the mismatch between their beliefs and what they're actually doing can contribute to strain, disillusionment, alienation. There could be confusion about what's right or wrong because people have certain beliefs, but then they feel like their peers are doing something different. And it's especially severe when they think it can put them at a competitive um, disadvantage. So like if I'm running, if I have some unique data, if I share it with others, then maybe they'll get the publications instead of me. So I'm going to hoard that data. That would be one, uh, you know, one example. Uh, so two questions just to end the, uh, th this, this part of the, the session, you know, number one, how can current scientific practice be brought back into line with our core values? That's really a central discussion and debate in the open science world that you'll hear a lot about this week in terms of all these new practices and tools that are trying to do just this. And second, you might just ask yourself, how severe are these real world problems? You know, is it the 10% following the norms or the 70%? So I'll present some data in my next lecture on this. And again, there's um, some work that I've alluded to, and it's not in my slides, but again, Katie and Alex can point you towards our preprint or working paper on Meta Archive for what's called the 3S study, the state of social science study. So if you're interested in like kind of very recent survey data, similar to Anderson et al, like where do social scientists fall in terms of their beliefs about these practices and their actual adoption? Uh, we have some new data 
on that as well. I think what's encouraging about our data is when we look over the last decade, we've seen big changes across four large social science fields. It does look like practices are changing, uh, but they're not there yet. So that's the, the kind of punchline um, punch there. So let me open it up for discussion. I maybe have about five minutes uh, left. I do see some stuff in the chat, some comments in the chat, which is um, great. And then I'm also happy for people to ask questions live uh, if they want. So again, I see um, a comment here from, uh, okay, I just got Ruben and Steven. So let me go back to Steven. Is there a way we can gauge which of the final two questions is misaligned with reality? People don't realize that they actually don't follow norms or people are poor judges of their peers. Moreover, how, if at all, do optimal practices of these norms change with technology or other cultural changes? So this is, these are all, there's three or four really good questions here. This notion of, you know, the 10 versus the 70%, you know, are people just pessimistic about their colleagues or can't judge their colleagues? Well, that's something we've really dealt with in our new working paper, as you guys will see. So one of the things we're finding is both beliefs, own beliefs and practices seem to be changing very quickly. But when we ask people about their colleagues, we're still seeing a lot of pessimism about colleagues' beliefs and practices, even though we're like verifying that adoption of these practices is changing. So there could be, when we're in a transitional phase, like we are now, there could be some mismatch because people's beliefs about their colleagues may be outdated. So I think that's one possible way to kind of reconcile these differences is if, you know, it could be that asking people what they're doing and seeing what they're doing is actually the best way to see where the field uh, is at. Then you ask a question here, Stephen, about optimal practices and how they change with technology or culture. I think the first thing to do is try to identify these better practices. And that's, again, what the open science community has been trying to do to point us like, you know, towards four or five improvements we can make. Um, so that, that's the first thing. Um, but you're saying, how do these change with technology or culture? I think that's uh, really central. Um, the, the sorts of technologies we have access to can shape what's optimal. And again, before the internet, it'd be pretty hard to have open sharing of data in the same way that we can now. So I think technology is really key. And you'll hear about lots of technological improvements, even related to version control and uh, you know, around data repositories where new technologies can, can really change best practice. Okay, thanks for those. Uh, Ruben, ask a question here again. Do you see the requirements for tenure changing in the profession over the next decade? decades? This is very hard. There's, again, been discussion of this in our, our research community. Um, I don't have an answer for it. The one thing that I will say is there have been moves in a positive direction. So I'll just give you like one very specific example. And this may seem small, but I think it's like a step forward. In the last few years, there's been a big push towards data sharing and code sharing. So researchers and the social scientists now are likely to share their data and code at a much higher rate than was the case before. And again, our, our 3S study documents that. Um, what's been a positive development is now the data repositories um, have made those data sets and code citable. They're given digital object identifiers, DOIs, to make it easy to cite data. So that may seem like a small thing, but what that means is if I've generated new data and code that others can reuse, now they can cite me, and that'll show up on Google Scholar, on citation engines, et cetera, as a citation of my work, my work product. So to the extent that tenure committees care about the influence of scientific work and they care about citations, now all of a sudden, sharing my data with the community can benefit me in terms of my tenure case. So that's just one sort of subtle example of many. Uh, the same thing for pre-analysis plans, which I'll talk about next. When they're citable, I can get credit for them. So I think there's many such changes we'll need, but this is one small step uh, forward. Okay, let me just see. There's a couple of other really good questions here. Great. Um, so Alex posted the preprint. Thanks, Alex. And then uh, Sha'on um, asked, the focus, the focus of open science advocacy on funders may be a good way to build in transparency requirements for researchers. For instance, requiring pre-analysis plan 
Posting de-identified data could be made a default requirement for research funds. I wonder what y'all think of funders as a key target. Absolutely, Katie is gonna talk about that as part of the rare proposal that multiple members of the ecosystem could weigh in and change norms. And in fact, some of this is already starting. Some large scale donors in my own field of development economics are now pushing much more strongly than ever before on data sharing and pre-analysis plans. So this is starting to happen. And I think one of our dreams really is to have the really big funders, the NIHs and NSFs go in this direction. A lot of people in NIH and NSF here in the US are very interested in going in this direction. We know that for a fact. So um, I think that's a great point, Sha'on. Um, and then we have Ru Ruben again. Um, do you think the stat on researchers with non-US PhDs is a reflection of the poor training received back home? And given the inherent disadvantage in resources training, maybe they see counter norms as more conducive. I really, this is from Rohit, thanks Rohit. I don't know, and I don't know enough about the data and Anderson at all to know this uh, for sure. Um, in our own um, data that we collected recently, we also have folks based at US universities and internationally, we, we find a kind of similar difference, um, but it's really hard to know exactly what it is. There's one possibility though around open science you know, attitudes and practices, which is, uh, so you raise one, maybe having more resources enables you to adopt these practices. That's an interesting point. The other one is at least in, in recent years, some of the, the early work around open science did take place in the US, although there's also leading centers elsewhere. I don't mean to downplay, there's leading centers in Germany. We have colleagues in Africa working on open science. I mean, it's a global movement, but some of the very high profile early work was done you know, in a couple of US universities. So maybe, you know, these ideas are kind of spreading uh, and maybe folks at certain US universities kind of heard about them first. So that's another, another possibility. Uh, and I think I have one more question here. This is from Ahwaz. Um, also worth it to think about issues around power relations. Science is not apolitical and norms may be reinforced inequalities. Are there different norms that are more relevant to different research environments? This is a great point. I think it relates to some of these um, these issues. Science is not apolitical. I think if any of us thought it was apolitical, say those of us in the US, uh, in the last few years, we've seen that if there's a kind of like actively anti-science government, um, it makes science political. You know, if science is saying policy A isn't working and those in power have a lot invested in saying policy A is working, they're going to oppose the science potentially. And I think that's what we've seen recently, even around the COVID crisis, the climate crisis, uh, research around racial bias and policing. It's issue after issue. You know, um, science has weighed in with a perspective that may challenge those in power. And that's not just in the US, that's a global issue. Um, and so, you know, having the space to be a scientist, to investigate what you want, to speak the truth. I think Merton was really right. It is tied up with being in an open, inclusive, democratic society. And when there's a narrowing in political space and discourse, science can get squeezed. So I think these norms and these issues are as relevant as ever. At least that, that's my own personal view. And I don't mean to be too political. I'm trying to kind of be objective about it. I think it's an issue that in many countries uh, is, is really salient. Okay, I'm not sure if I have any time left. I think we're right at, at time. Um, yep. And uh, I'm happy to leave it off there. These were really great questions in the chat box.